Ukraine's prime minister says that he's confident his country will receive the $6.5 billion that it needs this year for its rapid reconstruction program. And it comes after a conference in London where international donors pledged billions more in non-military aid to help rebuild Ukraine and to weed out corruption. Kiev says that recovering from Russia's invasion will be the largest reconstruction project in Europe since the Second World War and that Russia should pay for it. Our partners support the idea of using frozen Russian assets for the reconstruction of Ukraine. That's what we've been talking about for the last year. Russia must pay for all this destruction, for all the tragedies it has committed and is committing in Ukraine. Well, now I want to bring in Kira Rudik. She is a member of the Ukrainian parliament and is head of the opposition Holos Party. She joins us tonight from Kyiv. Kira, it's good to see you again. You know, we just heard from Denis Shmihal saying that Russia should be made to pay for the damage that it has caused to your country. I want to ask you, as someone who has a direct line to what's going on inside the government, have you been told how it's going to work? How are you going to be repaid by Russia? Hello, Brian. Thank you so much for having me on the um, program again. So uh, I truly believe that we should uh, talk to our partners and make sure that it is not uh, our partners' money, their taxpayers' money that are used for the rebuild of Ukraine, but Russian money. As of right now, there are at least $500 billion of Russian oligarch and state assets that are being stored and frozen under the sanctions. And I think it is completely unfair that this money uh, remain untouched. And meanwhile, we are asking and we are receiving their support from the countries that actually support us. Mm. So the mechanisms uh, in terms of the legal and political way, they may be different. But but uh, what we see right now is that the intention is there to make sure that these assets are being used to repair for the damage that Russia caused to our country. Okay, but I just want to be clear on that. The, the intention is there, but the actual mechanism of taking these frozen assets and sending them to Ukraine, that has yet to be presented um, to lawmakers. Is that correct? Well, in some countries, yes. But, for example, Canada have already passed the legislation and first $23 million of frozen money of oligarch Abramovich are already there on the way to be used for the sake of Ukraine. United States have already passed the bill and they have $5 million uh, in the same process as well. And what we have heard from our allies in Estonia that they are developing the legal mechanism as well so that uh, then the uh, European countries can uh, mimic that and uh, uh, have it done really quickly. What we wish would happen that the United Kingdom that already has the bill in the parliament would go uh, forward with it because it defines the mechanism of how this money can be used. You know, there are a lot of people watching this story and asking, aren't we talking about reconstruction too early because the war is still going on? That's one point. And the second point is, with the history of corruption in Ukraine, um, how can we be sure that the money for reconstruction will be used for reconstruction? Sure. So first of all, uh, regarding uh, the uh, process of how money would be used, and um, um, we are very open to set up the processes uh, to make sure that there are zero doubts about how the money is used. And we have already experience of the private funds and the public funds that are very good with their reporting, and they have very good reputation and zero issues. Regarding when to start reconstruction, the issue is that we have to exist right now. People who lost their homes after the terrorist attack at the uh, Kahovka Dam have to find their homes right now. We have to rebuild our infrastructure right now and get ready with our energy infrastructure for the uh, upcoming winter right now. We have to uh, make sure that um, we exist and live and can uh, have children going to school right now. We cannot wait until the war is over. And this is why we are talking about it, uh, uh, about reconstruction right away, mm -hmm. not at some foreseeable future. You know that uh, progress 
on the battlefield and the prospect of an end to this war would certainly help to raise more money for reconstruction. So let me ask you, I mean, what stage is the Ukrainian counteroffensive? What stage is it at at this moment? The counteroffensive is on. And all the questions that are being asked about uh, when we will see some major victories, uh, they, they want me to remind you how the last year's counteroffensive went. At the beginning, it was very slow and it uh, was um, a lot under the hood. And then we have seen the major improvements and we have seen major results. So I think as of right now, there is no doubt that our military commandment is brilliant and they have shown uh, fantastic results with their um, capacity that they ha have in hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, from our side, we are just saying, let them do their job. And on another point, you know, as of right now, almost every Ukrainian family have somebody fighting at the front. Mm -hmm. So for us, it is very personal because for us, the counteroffensive means that people whom we love and know personally will have to uh, march forward, endangering their life and uh, um, having uh, like really, really intensive attacks. Yeah. And this is why we are looking at it not as some event that needs to happen, but actually something where we really want our military commandment to save as many lives as, as it is possible. There is a NATO summit next month, and it, it does not look like Ukrainian membership in NATO is going to be in the cards anytime soon. I, I want to ask you, will Kyiv be content with the seat on a Ukraine-NATO council that's being offered? Is that going to be enough? You know, over the last 15 months, we used to hear the word no about everything, starting from getting no for the candidates in European Union so many times, then getting no for getting the tanks, then getting no for getting patriots, and mm. hearing so many times the word no for getting um, the fighter jets. But we learned to push through that, and we know our goals. They are written in Ukrainian constitution. Ukraine to become an EU member, to become a NATO member. And we will be pushing to get to this result. Ukrainian lawmaker Kira Rudik joining us tonight from Kyiv. As always, Kira, we appreciate your time. And we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And glory to Ukraine.